Good afternoon and welcome back to Have We Got Planning News For You. Thanks very much indeed for joining us the second half of our uh, fourth series. Welcome, as usual, also to our YouTube viewers. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done so. And please do consider making a charity donation place of registration free. The usual charities we support are NHS Charities Together and Shelter, but if you'd rather donate to a charity of your choice, that would be equally great. Now, we're truly delighted um, today to, to welcome as our special guest, Tony Juniper, the chair of National Natural England, whose remarkable career as a champion uh, for the environment has included being executive director of Friends of the Earth, uh, director of advocacy and campaigns at WWF UK, president of the Royal Society of Wildlife Trust, and so much more. Um, Tony, thank you very much for joining us. Perhaps you can tell thank us you. where you're where you're calling us from and, and what, if anything, are you drinking this evening? Um, well, I'm at the bottom of my garden in Cambridge, uh, in what used to be a chicken shed. Uh, but I've moved in now and uh, we've cleaned up some of the feathers and the other debris uh -huh. they left behind. It's more pleasant than when they lived in here. Um, I'm drinking water uh, for the next hour or so. Then after that, I will have a review. <laughs> Very sensible. <laughs> You're not the first who won't be the last to say that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. As usual, we'll be um, having our discussion with uh, Tony in the second half of the show. But as I say to all guests, Tony, uh, please do um, chip in if there's anything we discuss beforehand that's of interest. No obligation, no, as it happens, by sheer serendipity. We are talking, amongst other things, about a case involving Natural England's uh, nitrates okay. policy. So there may be something to discuss there. Now, okay. it's time to uh, introduce uh, the panel. Um, Sasha's in disposed he's hoping to join us later but um, uh, he, he's got a, a double booking um, but in the meantime um, Mary perhaps uh, you'll tell us where your town legal offices are you? Yes I'm in town legal offices i am um, been doing a virtual inquiry this week closing speeches tonight so it's going to be a long one and I'm using my usual town legal mug and I'm drinking Yorkshire tea. Hello, Lovely. everyone. As always, we've all got very healthy supplies of that from the various Yorkshire guests we've had. Paul, good, good afternoon. How are you doing? Hello, Charlie. Uh, Paul Tucker, King's Chambers, uh, literally just burst in from uh, two days, not on virtual events. So yesterday, Court of Appeal in person, all very exciting, per perspex screens and masks. Today, site visit in North Wales. And appropriately enough, uh, I, I, I've got this, so I'm drinking, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, my only beer with wildlife on. Uh, it's uh, an age of age concern, Lancashire, purchased for me by my wife. I wonder if she's telling me something. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> I think there's definitely a subliminal message there, Paul. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Chris, uh, <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> I'm at Donnington. I'm at Donnington Motorway Service Area. You lucky chap. Donnington Motorway Service Area. It doesn't get more glamorous. <laughs> it does not. So well, good they named it twice. I can't eat. <laughs> Great stuff, Chris. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Um, I've been, John, you can hear me. I've been in the inquiry for the last two weeks. And, uh, mm, I think we're going to have a problem it, with young like, Chris it today. It sounds like God's in motorway service area urgently need to upgrade their Wi Fi provision. <laughs> well, Chris, hopefully you can sort it out next uh, next few minutes. Well, let's crack on with the, um, the case reports. And um, Mary, you're going to kick us off, I think, with a, another David Holgate masterpiece. I uh, would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, the Ocado case. You're on mute, uh, by the way. <laughs> uh, I know I tease you sometimes about um, always saying very nice things about Mr Justice Holgate and his judgments, but I absolutely agree with you on this occasion. I think this is a tour de force. This is the mother of all enforcement cases, 50 pages of sensational history analysis, and I might say judgments. I would say it's compulsory reading for anyone who wants to know anything about enforcement and certificates of lawful use uh, and development. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't recommend it more. So to get to the crux of it, in 1984, four units were granted planning permission subject to a condition that they be used for B1C or B2 uses and for no other purpose. Originally, these buildings were constructed for British Telecom, but then they, got, they were used by Royal Mail as a parcel force distribution warehouse. And an application was made in 2019 for a certificate for a B8 use on the basis that the buildings had been used for 10 years as a single planning unit in breach of that planning condition. No public consultation took place and the application was granted. 
Thereafter, Ocado, who were going to be the new tenants of the building, made a planning application. And in the course of making that planning application, the Cluid came to light. An application was then made to revoke the Cluid application under Section 1937 on the basis that the application that had been made contained information false in a material way. Islington, so this was in uh, the, the London Borough of Islington, revoked the, um, the Cluid, and the application before the court was an application for judicial review revoking the decision, uh, ch sorry, challenging the decision to revoke. Ocado claimed that it was not necessary um, to be using the premises as a warehouse at the time of the application, so long as the right hadn't been abandoned. Islington revoked it, deciding that the breach had to continue right up until the date of the application, although they also looked at it on the other basis. So if Ocado succeeded, they would have ended up with a restriction-free um, premises. And Mr. Justice Holgate takes us through some wonderful cases, Thurrock, Swale, North Devon, for those who are interested in, in this topic, and uh, comes to the conclusion that those cases, that the essence of those is, is that the test of whether a local authority would have, have been able or entitled to take an enforcement uh, action during the immunity period is central to a decision on whether the lawful right has accrued. He also took us through a wonderful trip on the abandonment cases, Hartley, Pioneer, Aggregates and Hughes, to mention just a few confirming that a lawful right that has accrued is capable of being abandoned, but that abandonment is not relevant to the accrual of such rights in the first place. Now, Section 191 requires the authority to be satisfied of the lawfulness of the matter in question at the date of the application of the uh, of the application for the Cluid, and not that that matter became lawful on that date. Um, uh, important point. So he said that the language makes it clear that the time limit for enforcement may have expired at some point prior to the application uh, date or the issuing of an enforcement notice. Put simply, you don't need to be doing it at the time of the application. Uh, and he reached what he described as a clear and certain conclusion that he wasn't going to follow um, a couple of earlier cases, Ellis and Nicholson, which uh, had decided that a breach of condition um, becomes lawful after continuing for 10 years uh, unless, uh, or sorry, does not remain lawful unless that breach continues thereafter. In other words, once you've accrued the right, according to the previous uh, cases, if you then stop using it as a warehouse, you would then lose that right. He found that was wrong. However, I'm afraid to say that he um, upheld the decision in relation to the application to revoke, accepting the uh, arguments of Islington that that matter needed to be looked at on an objective basis and that it didn't matter whether or not there was an intention to deceive. The fact is you just have to look at that um, objectively and on that basis, he declined to quash the decision to revoke the Cluid. Thanks, Mary. Really important case in terms of the time limits for breaches of condition. I say another masterpiece. In my excitement at seeing the Donington MSA achieve what judges, inspectors, and barristers throughout the the years have been unable to achieve, namely silence Chris Young QC. <laughs> um, I forgot to tell you where I was. Um, you might have detected it's not London, my usual abode. I'm, I'm in Portugal, um, having travelled here on the assurance that if it was going to be downgraded from the green list, there would be a green watch list, um, which didn't happen. Um, but um, rather and bring a claim for legitimate exploitation, I decided just to come anyway. And I'm drinking Sagres beer because I'm in Sagres, very near a national a national national park as well, uh, which is very beautiful. Um, now, um, Paul, over over to you, and um, you're going to discuss the the fair and judicial review, which concerns um, the uh, the perennial solid nitrates issue. It, it does. Before I do, can I just comment upon the Ocado, Ocado case? Um, and, and I say this through gritty teeth, having spoken to Okado a couple of times during lockdown and complained about various bits and bobs of things that were delivered to my home, that I feel very sorry for Okado as a result of that case. They were very much the innocent party. They came to a site having bought it um, uh, with an LDC in place, which is supposedly conclusive proof. There is some discussion about how we move forward with LDCs, I think, in future. Anyway, my case is uh, called 
uh, Her Majesty the Queen, are uh, on behalf on uh, 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 who's bringing cases on uh, by Ms. Wyatt on behalf of the Brook Avenue Residents Against Development. Guess what they're against? Uh, against Fair and Borough Council, various landowners who benefit from a planning permission and Natural England. It's a decision handed down by Mr. Justice J, J on the 28th of May. Uh, and it's a case relating to the assessment of nitrogen compound output of a proposed residential development within a region with a number of uh, wetland sites of international importance to birds. So this particular campaign group sought judicial review of Fairham's grant of permission for eight large four to five bedroomed houses. That's quite important in the context of the case within the Solent area. And as I say, there's a number of very important wetland uh, bird sites in that area. And the issue that the council grappled with was whether or not uh, those birds would be adversely affected by excessive levels of nitrogen compounds discharged into the water from housing as well as other development uh, in a cumulative fashion. Well, Natural England, as most people on this uh, uh, this uh, sh uh, the show uh, watch list would uh, would be aware, have long concluded that there is a, an issue with regards to the condition of wetlands in this, that area. Uh, as a result of additional nitrogen uh, nutrient outputs and that there's therefore some scientific uncertainty as to the impacts on new development and therefore the precautionary principle is engaged and for a period of time there have been various uh, attempts to try and work out how to get around that well natural england's uh, 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 advice uh, to local authorities was that only developments that were at the very worst uh, nitrogen <laughs> easy for me to say nutrient neutral uh, we need to work on that one. Nutrient neutral. Uh, should, so only those developments which are nutrient neutral should be granted permission. Uh, the, uh, the, the regs obliged authorities, of course, as we know, to avoid destruction of habitats and to assess the impact of the site on any relevant projects. Well, Fairham calculated using Natural England's advice note based upon the average occupancy of houses of 2.4 people across the UK. Um, and that's referred to specifically in Natural England's advice note in order to achieve nutrient neutrality uh, and found the development would in fact generate a nutrient debit, but that will be balanced by mitigation measures so as to result in a small credit. However, the difficulty with that was that wasn't specific to the eight, four to five bedroom houses where the average occupancy rate is three, not 2.4 people per house. So a challenge was brought on a number of grounds, but it's that ground that I need to grapple with. It's the most important. And so it was Essentially, the rationality uh, uh, was, was challenged of the occupancy rate used in the nutrient budget. Uh, so the, the obligation of the regulations is, of course, to uh, assess what the effect is overall. And one of the arguments that was raised was to say, well, if some of the properties are going to be above 2.4 in the UK, some are going to be below, it will all overall balance out. And therefore, you've got this sort of balance sheet approach. Well, Mr. Justice Jay said, no, that's not what the advice note says. It actually says that the uh, occupancy rate at 2.4 is the starting point and that therefore there was a difficulty because of the uh, occupancy being three. However, and this is the big however, it didn't follow that 2.4 wasn't sufficiently precautionary in the circumstance of this case and that because the occupancy rate of three meant that the difference between the two was still uh, not a high number and all the other precautionary elements tucked away in the notice meant that overall the precautionary principle was established and that therefore Ms. White hadn't shown on a Wensbury basis, namely on an irrationality basis, uh, that the appropriate assessment hadn't been sufficiently precautionary. Um, and the court also pointed out that perhaps the advice note should be reviewed to set out more clearly the circumstances in which bespoke rather than generic calculations should be, re uh, should be used. So there were a number of other cha challenge points in there which also failed. So the, 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 the challenge ultimately failed. But that's an important point, which is to say, take a sensible view of the advice note overall. There's a lot of robustness in relation to it. And don't just poke holes with one aspect, which makes not, a much, not much of a difference, and expect to get home. It is, um, having flattered one member of the judiciary on this show uh, today, I'll, I'll flatter another. Mr Justice Jay, absolutely bob on in relation to that determination. Thanks, Jolly. Thank Thanks, Paul. Uh, and before I hand over to Chris, just a word on, on the case that Sasha was going to dis discuss, which, which is, is um, in the same vein. So it's a decision um, of Inspector Gareth Fort uh, of a few days ago, allowing an appeal by um, 
Renaissance um, Retirement Living, part of the Life Story Group, in relation to a proposal for 44 units of um, sheltered housing on a previously developed site in Limington, in the Solent, Solent um, catchment area. And um, it's, it's a multifaceted decision, but just to highlight three aspects of it. Firstly, on nutrient neutrality, um, the inspector accepted um, the... Um, the approach of, of purchasing nitric credits from the farmer, but there were two options before him, one of which was a direct arrangement between the um, developer and Mr. Heaton, the farmer on the Isle of Wight, which would have taken place by a Section 106, or alternatively, a Grampian condition uh, providing the development shouldn't be occupied until the strategic um, Solent-wide arrangement um, being undertaken by three councils in the, in the catchment area was in place, and he would rely on that instead. And the inspector preferred the strategic approach so there's an interesting angle there secondly on biodiversity net gain uh, another point may, might be interesting Tony so there um, the the calculation was the development would achieve a 12 percent net gain and the council gave that negligible weight their words on the basis that it was barely more than was required and the inspector had to, he, he, he said well actually it's not currently required because whilst paragraph 170d of the framework uh, requires net gains the specified percentage of 10 percent is set out in the environment bill which isn't yet law uh, and in any event he accepted the argument but even if it were required why should it get negligible weight isn't it the same as for example affordable housing where delivery of compliant levels of affordable housing can still get very considerable weight where it's needed. Uh, so he, he saw that as a clear benefit to the scheme, consistently with the decision of the Secretary of State in Burley and Wharfdale, um, a few on the 3rd of March, where the Secretary of State gave great weight to, buy, to biodiversity net gain. So an interesting angle there. My own view is it'd be quite nice if policy had a sliding scale of percentages. And if you give, if you'll fall within a particular percentage bracket, which moderate weight, higher percentage bracket, significant weight and so on. And that would give developers a real incentive to do their best rather than just the minimum 10% in due course. And finally, it's yet another, following on from the fleet decision that we covered a couple of weeks ago, yet another um, summary of the benefits of, of specialist older persons living, um, which is uh, manna from heaven for those who promote that kind of development. So that's a, a worthy read. Uh, and with that, over to Chris. Chris, you, you look like you're about to be served your happy meal any moment now. Um, <laughs> people have seen what toy they present you with. Um, and you're going to tell us about a Greenbelt case that um, Zach Simons achieved a remarkable victory in. I, I am. I just, I don't know if this is going to work because two coach loads of children have just come in and uh, you're, that's the, my background. And I am, of course, not breaching the regulations. I'm not, uh, I'm having credits from, uh, from Marks and Spencers. Um, this is the biggest case uh, we've ever had, in my opinion. This is for anybody interested in the green belt, and um, it's going to upset housing crisis deniers everywhere because this is the release of a green belt site, which is green field. Paul and I have done a bit of that, but this one is unallocated, unproposed in any plan, no enabling developments associated with like Paul's C cells. This is just a straightforward, unallocated greenfield, greenbelt site that has been released for housing in St Albans and for uh, and in Well and Hatfield as well. This is a decision um, of Inspector Masters, Roundhouse Farm, Bullens Lane, uh, Colney Heath, and um, it's a hundred houses on a greenfield site. Um, in St Albans, and as you can see, the applicant was Canton Limited and they were successful. Uh, notice the affordable housing, that's 45%. The policy required only 30%. And uh, also notice the self-build there as well, um, which all went to enhance the offer. So you've got 55% affordable and self-build. Um, and uh, they were successful. Now, what's really, really interesting in this decision, not only is it, an unallocated, unpreferred greenfield site in the Greenbelt. But have a look at the inspector's conclusion, if we can bring it up at paragraph 26, is a conclusion in relation to safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. And the inspector comes to the conclusion that there isn't any harm under this. She said she's already set out her assessment of character and appearance. Uh, it's edge of urban. There was built development around several sides of it. I've made a clear distinction between the appeal site and its separation from the countryside beyond. In this way, the appeal site is influenced by the surrounding residential developments. As a result of these locational characteristics and influences, the consequences of the development of the appeal site would mean the proposal would have only a localised effect on the Greenbelt, the broad thrust and function, 
would effectively remain. And I therefore conclude the appeal proposal would not result in harm in terms of the encroachment to the Greenbelt in this location. I mean, what a fantastically strong and robust decision. Um, she does accept, obviously, there's harm to openness. She can't avoid that. Um, but that's a really significant conclusion. If we turn to paragraph 53, that's in relation to affordable housing. Now, Welland haven't got their plan in place yet, and St Albans' plan was found unsound, and basically affordable housing had collapsed. Look at those figures. Recent delivery in Welland Hatfield in the third line, uh, since 2015-16, the last five years, they delivered at a rate of only 23 homes per annum, so that the shortfall was 4,000 that had accumulated. And uh, in St Albans, SADC, it was even worse. They'd been delivering um, 35 a year, uh, well, about the same, and they had a shortfall of 4,000 dwellings in their affordable housing. So that affordable housing evidence from Jane Stacey, very, very powerful. The self-built evidence, very, very important. And um, overall, a fantastic success. I think we've got an aerial photograph of the, of, the, of the site provided by the planning consultant who instructed Zach, which is uh, Russell Gray at Woods Hardwick. And you can see it's a really obvious site to release, isn't it? Look at all that built development all around it. Um, the site next door, which looks like a sort of campus, had actually been refused at appeal a few years ago. Um, but after, I, I think the key ingredient was after St Albans plan had been found unsound, and they were thrown back to the 1994 plan, you got a situation where there's no effective planning at all. So the inspector took it into her own hands. A really strong, a really good decision. Um, of course, you'd expect me to mention this. It was my appeal, but unfortunately, I couldn't do the dates. I am absolutely gutted. OK, but well done. Well done, Zach. Well done to the whole team. Fantastic results. I think we've got the appearances, have we, uh, Rob, just at the end? Always good to see who's played in the band. And uh, lead vocals, uh, Zach Simon, uh, Andrew Crutchley was on drums. Uh, and you could see uh, a, good, a good display of professional witnesses making the housing case on affordable self-build. Um, and uh, I think the council just conceded Ben Pycroft's evidence on private land supply. And uh, I believe town legal were involved, Mary. And uh, it was your colleague, Paul Arnott, as well. So a great, fantastic decision. And um, I imagine that particular band will be touring the whole of Britain. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's a uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating, important case. Um, now, um, let's crack on with our interview with Tony. Um, and Tony, once again, thank you so much indeed um, for joining us. We're going to come back to reconciling the housing crisis with other, other crises I I in a moment. Um, but Tony, mm. perhaps you can start um, uh, from your position as, as chair of Natural England in just telling us a, a bit about what are Natural England's top priorities at the present time. Well, uh, at the moment, Charlie, uh, the big priority is linked with the government's ambition for nature recovery. Uh, we encapsulate our mission uh, today as building partnerships for nature's recovery, because what we've been doing for the past 70 years as a nation uh, through various legal and policy codes is to try and hang on to various remnants of natural habitat, remnant populations of rare species, and not only have we been struggling with that, but we've also realised that we don't have enough nature in the country today to do carbon capture, to purify our rivers, to provide for the health and well-being of the country. And so it's not only any longer about protecting the little bits that are left, it's now about rebuilding a lot of what has gone. And this is where you see various uh, elements of the Environment Bill lining up behind that ambition. Uh, the idea of local nature recovery strategies, which will be a statutory uh, new spatial planning approach that will come from the Environment Bill, plus the idea of biodiversity net gain, uh, pushing us in that direction now of realising some of the aims in the 25-year Environment Plan, which are in the headline sense to leave nature in a better state than we found it. And so that's what we're getting behind as an organisation. And obviously, some of the things that you've talked about today in those cases are very much linked to that. Mm -hmm. I did actually note uh, in Chris's case there, in that map showing where the new housing development will go, a piece of woodland on the left of the area that will be developed and a piece of woodland on the right hand side 
And if we are going to have local nature recovery strategies into the future, it will be the case that one of the things we'll need to be doing is linking up those bits of woodland. And so although it wasn't a material concern in this case, in the future, it should be uh, to say that actually not only are we looking at the places where we can develop housing, we also need to be looking at the places where we can recover nature, not only the places where it's already important and needs to be protected. And so some big implications uh, there, Chris, I think, from new policy as we go into the future and how we are going to reconcile housing development targets with the recovery of nature, not only protecting what's already there, which is going to require a slightly different set of filters to be able to master that. So would that be involved, for example, sort of using development as an ally of the environment in the right places, whereby, for example, the layout uh, and landscaping of a, of a development such as that could, as well as delivering the housing, um, could also reintroduce the, the link between those two fragmented habitats? Well, ideally, yes, that, that would be the case. And uh, what we will need to do, I think, to succeed in this new world of nature recovery is to be taking a far broader view of the landscape. And so it, at Natural England, we talk about going beyond projects and looking at plans. And so to make sense of that landscape and those little fragments of woodland and grass and that are left and how we can reconnect them and do nature recovery in the most rational way is going to require us to zoom out somewhat and to look at, you know, the, the whole of the greenbelt around St Albans, connecting into other areas of greenbelt in neighbouring towns, looking at the corridors of wildlife habitat that exist and how we can strengthen and rebuild those. And so that's going to be um, a challenge, but um, very much one that at Natural England we can see the sense of. And actually in the Environment Bill, we are expecting to see Natural England equipped with the ability to take that more strategic approach and be moving beyond individual planning cases and to be looking at the wider landscape. So that's something uh, that we will be assessing as we go forward and looking not only at the environment bill, of course, and those local nature recovery strategies, but also looking at how that will relate to the planning bill that we're expecting to come to Parliament this autumn and how these two things will mesh together. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think has frustrated both developers and environmentalists over the years is the extent to which these things clash. You know, mm -hmm. uh, do we want environment or do we want development? If the environment bill and the planning bill are going to succeed in, in dealing with that tension, these things have to be brought together so that we just don't recreate the problem with two new sets of legislation. So if we finish up with local nature recovery strategies and the planning bill reforms still being separate, we're not going to have solved many problems. We're just going to recreate the problem we've got now, whereby nature and environment and development clash. Mm. And so we need to get beyond that and, and ensure that these two new spatial planning approaches, one for nature, one for development, they need to be the same thing effectively. Uh, and so this is going to be a very interesting period as, as we seek to line up these two separate but hopefully very complementary uh, new policies and, and legal uh, approaches. Is the structure of government uh, adequately set up for that? Because it's a strange quirk in, in one sense that your, your when I say your, I mean Natural England's lead department is, is DEFRA, um, but planning, which is of course one of the policy areas which most affects the environment domestically, is led by MHCLG. And, and the two bills you've, you've just noted, of course, are led respectively by those two respective departments. Do you think that at the top level, environmental policy and governance is sufficiently joined up? I don't think it's only a problem for government. I think it's a problem for pretty much every kind of organisation I've ever encountered. Uh, this problem of siloed activity. Uh, you know, even in environmental organisations, we struggled with, uh, you know, um, is our work we're doing on transport, is that fully aligned? with the work that we're doing on nature conservation. I remember that kind of discussion uh, in Friends of the Earth years ago. And, you know, government uh, obviously, you know, siloed into departments and being able to find the connections between those silos is critical for environmental delivery. Because if you, if you look at the environmental ambition we have as a country now, whether it's on uh, greenhouse gas pollution or whether it's on the recovery of, of wildlife, uh, you know, a lot of the delivery of that isn't through the department that's got environment in its name. You know, it's in transport, it's in business, and even it's in health and in education uh, to a great extent. And so how we build cross-government momentum for these environmental targets, it is absolutely critical. And there's been various attempts going back actually to 
the Environment White Paper in 1990, uh, where Chris Patton, uh, at the time Environment Secretary, invented the idea of green ministers. And so there being a minister in each department uh, to, you know, look after the environmental delivery side. And, you know, there's been various manifestations of that kind of thinking ever since, but evidently still more work to do because every department sees its core business as, you know, in the name. And so, you know, the housing department sees housing as its main thing and environment comes secondary to that. Uh, so how we fix that particular disconnect is is really vital, but work in progress, I would say. Really fascinating. Yes, no, it's not an easy, not an easy that one. Um, no. You mentioned, we've mentioned uh, biodiversity net gain. I'm not sure, is it biodiversity net gain or net biodiversity gain? I'm never sure which way around the words go, but whichever way, um, the, re- the requirement for 10% in England um, seems likely to be soon enshrined in law. Um, and depending on who you speak to, some people say it, it imposes yet another burden on an over, o- already overburdened development sector, whereas others say it doesn't go far enough. And you've heard my thoughts about you know, the, the danger of, of a lack of an incentive on developers to go further unless some policy carrot is dangled. What's your view? Is the balance correctly struck? Is it the end result or is it perhaps the first step towards a broader natural capital based approach? Um, it, well, it's a welcome step. Um, wh- whether it's enough, we'll, we'll have to see uh, in the quality of the deployment, really. But the idea that development will be uh, required to leave nature and the natural environment in a better state than they found it, I think everyone um, can see the sense of that, or at least everyone with, with any understanding of the environmental situation that we face in the country at the moment. And so... Um, Yes, it it is going to be a a welcome move forward, and it's going to have to strictly reflect this idea uh, of a mitigation hierarchy. So it will need to avoid, um, it would need development still to avoid protected places, sites of special scientific interest. It will need to look at the mitigation that can go on in relation to the local environment, avoiding areas of woodland or or, uh, high quality grass and other priority habitats. And then to be looking at how, after you've done all of that, can you deliver this this um, offset um, uh, somewhere else? And you know, discussions going on about whether you bundle up those biodiversity net gains from different developments to deliver a big thing somewhere that may be some distance from uh, where the developments are occurring, or whether you might want to focus uh, the biodiversity net gain into the local area. And, and probably there will be a blend of the two uh, depending on the local circumstances. But I think. You know, there will be a premium in high quality local delivery of biodiversity net gain, not least because, you know, very often the opposition to a housing development is coming on environmental grounds from the local people. And so giving them something back in their local area, um, I think, would be something that people would see the sense of. But this is going to need to be high quality biodiversity net gain. This is not about putting in a few trees and a little bit of grass uh, nearby. It's going to have to have real value. Uh, for nature and to be done in a way which is, you know, demonstrably uh, doing that. And that will require local authorities to have uh, the right kind of expertise. And, you know, ideally, I think people would see that as being in-house expertise so that local authorities, you know, do have ecologists on the staff again. Some of them still do, but a lot of them don't. At Natural England, we will hope to play a role in ensuring high quality and consistency across the country. Um, But if we're going to get maximum value out of this, we will need to be investing in that expertise to be making sure that that we that we do get delivery. And uh, of course, you know, big questions about the extent to which we get delivery over time. You know, will the habitats that have been created be maintained and how are we going to be making sure that's the case? And so those questions will need to be answered. Thank you. Uh, and then Chris touched already on, on the housing crisis, which, of course, is, is a matter of fundamental concern um, to our viewers and others, too. Uh, but we also have a climate crisis. Um, how, um, in your view, do we reconcile the two to ensure that um, neither crisis falls victim to the other and we don't have a sort of unhappy compromise, yeah. but the two can both be achieved? Yeah, well, actually, um, th- these things, they are twin crises. Uh, and the word twin is important because it means they've got the same origin and they're closely related. Uh, and, you know, th- these two things, sometimes we trade them off uh, uh, in, in policy and, and, in, and in the ways in which we approach them. And, you know, planting a load of trees over 
uh, an important grassland would be a good example of the wrong kind of trade-off where you're damaging an important natural asset in order to catch carbon. And so we do need a really joined up approach in, in how we do the, the, the low carbon and, and the biodiversity recovery. The way I talk about it very often is to say what we need to be doing is going low carbon and high nature at the same time. Uh, and, you know, there are benefits in doing this in a good way. So one of the things that will be more of a, of a challenge for us as we go forward, and the Climate Change Committee said this yesterday, is that we will be suffering from the, the effects of extreme weather more and more. So flooding is one effect. And so could we be building in to the biodiversity net gain a level of climate change resilience? So sustainable drainage is one thing that we might want to be looking at more. So the creation of wetlands, which would be good for wildlife, and which could be reducing the flood risk on a particular uh, development at the same time as catching carbon. These are the kinds of sweet spots that we should be aiming for. And you know that same wetland could be helping to catch nutrients, which are then not gonna be going into the river. Uh, and thereby helping to solve another problem. And so that joined up um, delivery of multiple benefits is something that we really do need to be catching through this biodiversity net gain opportunity. And also through the original design of the development in the first place. You know, and a lot of um, this conflict between nature, natural environment and development is a function of not seeing the big picture up front. And so again, zooming back out to look at the landscape, where is the best place where we can accommodate the nature-based solutions and the housing and social benefits at the same time? And to be able to map that in a way where we've got that integrated view from the start and you know, ecological design being built in at the beginning is something which I fear we've not been very good at in this country. And indeed, I can't think of many countries that have been very good at it. But, you know, if you've got the ecologists sitting with the planners and the, and the, and the developers at the beginning, you can solve a lot of problems before they emerge. And that's going to be good for everybody in terms of streamlining the decision making to get to good places without having to have these conflicts that come when you have poorly designed development that didn't take account of the nature, didn't see the opportunities for joined up solutions and thus missing them. And so, you know, again, that brings us back to the local nature recovery strategies and the future planning reforms and how those things map together uh, and how we can, you know, spot the big uh, wins at the beginning rather than having an argument about the conflicts at the end, if you see my, my point. I mean, of course, the, the, the pandemic has been a game changer. I've spent um, two and a half years of my life until um, mid last year uh, in the litigation about the Heathrow Third Runway, where climate change right. was, was fundamental to that debate, as you'll know. Um, and of course, fast forward a year, uh, and you know, they'd be delighted if they could fill one runway um, on one day of the week. Yeah, exactly. um, I mean, what, what are the main opportunities do you think the pandemic presents longer term for, for fundamental change in our relationship with the environment? Well, I, w w w one huge thing that has changed is the extent to which people have been using their local natural environment. And, you know, on the national nature reserves that we manage uh, at Natural England, we've seen a massive increase in footfall, quadrupling, sixfold increase. And it's been very different people that have been using the national nature reserves. Normally, it would be bird watchers or people interested in a particular dragonfly, those kinds of specialists. But we've seen families turning up with young children and going out for the day and having a picnic. And this has been transformative in terms of their feelings about the natural environment. And I think will create an expectation about the quality of green space that will be blended in to new developments into the future. And so that, I would think, would be increasingly reflected in how policymakers are looking at this and the expectations of planning authorities. And so, you know, there is a huge opportunity there to harness some of that realisation about the value of nature for public health and well-being. And also, you know, some really quite big structural things, I think, that will feed through. Uh, so, for example, uh, quite a lot of companies now will be needing less office space. If we go to this blended way of working, which people have been talking about, two or three days uh, a week commuting rather than five days a week commuting, this is going to lead to a 40 to 60% reduction in the demand for office space. So what does that mean about the future of town centres uh, in terms of the moving from commercial purposes to residential purposes? And then what does that mean for green belt development and the perceived need for housing demand in terms of new build rather than repurposing office space? 
space? What does it mean for investments in infrastructure like roads? Do we then uh, see a switch in investment of road building budgets into broadband? I don't know. These are the kinds of questions that you might expect to come. And what about car parking spaces in cities? Might we like to see that turned into wild spaces where we have the creation of natural habitats for people who live in the city centres to enjoy? You know, and those kinds of, of ramifications and knock-ons, I don't think we've begun to even consider those yet in terms of policy but I think they will be real concerns as we go forward and as you say Charlie you know big infrastructure like runways you know the business case for those has literally evaporated is it going to come back I don't know but a lot of businesses that I've been interacting with over recent months they're wondering why they spent so much money and so much time on aeroplanes when they're having perfectly good interactions through the medium we're using this afternoon. Mm, absolutely absolutely um i love the car park idea um it reminds me of the high line in new york which i think is one of the best things um you know the best things to come out of you know, urban design in a long time last question for me and then i'll hand over to the rest of the panel um yeah. about um post brexit environmental protection so we uh, we're hearing increasing murmurings um, from government about uh post brexit amendments the habitats eia and sea regimes amongst others albeit the detail yeah. for now remains largely lacking um, are you satisfied, Tony, that environmental protections won't be unduly diluted in the forthcoming years? Well, if we are going to achieve the targets being set out domestically and indeed internationally of the kind at the G7 last week, where we've said we're going to halt and reverse the decline of nature, we cannot diminish protections. We have to enhance them and we have to go further with measures that are not only going to be protecting nature, but also leading to its recovery. I, th I think that's pretty clear. You, you can't on the one side uh, have an elevation in your ambition and then on the other have a reduction in your delivery. Uh, the, the, the two don't sit happily together. What we can do is to find better ways of doing some of these things, I would say, and to be looking at some of the processes which have taken up a lot of efforts, but not necessarily delivered a lot of outcome, and to be wondering could we do better in the future in focusing more on outcomes? Mm. And a good example of this in relation to some of the European codes uh, that are now being talked about uh, uh, in terms of reform is how we've approached some protected species. So, for example, the great crested newt has been an icon of, uh, you know, delays to development and newt is discovered, houses cannot be built. So what we've been looking at lately and are now implementing uh, at Natural England is a new approach called district level licensing, moving beyond the situation where a newt could stop a housing development to be saying, if there is a newt, let's build newt habitat elsewhere on a far bigger scale than the damage to the habitat that's going to result from this building development, thereby improving the conservation status of the Great Crested Newt and enabling the housing to go ahead more quickly. And everybody's happy, especially the newts, because you finish up with many more newt ponds as a result of there being an offset in a different uh, location. It's an example of biodiversity net gain. It's the same principle. Uh, some biodiversity will be lost as a result of this, but we will invest in a mechanism that will lead to much more biodiversity, in this case, in the form of the Great Crested Newt, uh, being created uh, through steps taken elsewhere. And so we could be looking at how we could do more of that. It's in that same vein of, of, of net gain, and it's in the spirit of recovery rather than conserving every last newt, uh, but will be based on improving the conservation status of that species. Now, we're looking at doing something similar with bats. How we do this in relation to habitat, well, the biodiversity net gain piece uh, is already being talked about in terms of non-designated uh, and not protected habitats. So, you know, we've got a few uh, examples of how this might go. Um, but I think the idea that we're going to be diminishing protection um, is the wrong one, because we're going to have to improve conservation delivery as we go forward. Uh, and that's not to say that we, we, we shouldn't look at changing what we've got and we can do and, you know, we will be doing as a result of what's government's decided. Um, but I think we have to look at the idea of doing better rather than doing less, I think is how I would frame it. Thanks, Tony. Well, I know Paul's got a question on the same, same theme, actually. So over to you, Paul. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, Tony. Um, the, it, it's, it's interesting that you raise the district licensing approach because the one problem that we have as practitioners is that when you're advising clients, you're advising about risk. And the, the prospect of saying, instead of taking on the, the local authority in Natural England with regard to whether there are sufficient mitigation measures being taken for, say, great crested newts, 
that at the very outset, you can say to a client, look, pay £105,000 to the district licensing scheme, and you have completely de-risked that part, you've reduced that element, you focus on other things, is a huge attraction to developers. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean it's an upfront tax. It means it has to be directed towards that element. Yeah. Both sides win because what you're doing is you're making the newts happy and you're also de-risking yeah. the process. My, so my question really is, I've spent the last 30 years with ecology seeming to get ever more complex and ever more tied into litigation and process and the interaction between European law, et cetera. We've got HRAs, eight, uh, appropriate assessments, and not just applications, but plan makings. I've been involved in plan where, a number of plans which have fallen foul because of appropriate assessments. Sh should we use the opportunity that we now got with following Brexit, with the environment yeah. bill, et cetera, to say, let's focus upon what actually matters, which is enhancing the environment, not focusing upon a uh, 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 process, and paying for lawyers, feel free not to that's answer. Uh, well, that, that's where the discussion is going, uh, and you know, various manifestations of this. Uh, the Secretary of State has announced uh, uh, his intention to have a look at the habitats regulations assessments, and there will be an amendment going forward to the Environment Bill to facilitate that. Uh, we've got the biodiversity net gain idea, and also the the example of the Great Crested Newt, plus the intention to look at other opportunities to do that kind of thing. So this is the direction of travel. What we have to ensure that we do as we go along is that as we review and as we look at opportunities to do things differently, that we don't finish up weakening protections because that would be uh, not, well, it wouldn't be compatible with the overall direction of, of uh, where we're going now, which is about nature recovery. You know, a lot of the codes that have been there and the ones that were still operating, they have been used by people against particular developments, you know, to, to oppose and to delay. And the legal process has been used as a way of stopping development. Yeah. And sometimes in a way which has not really got much to do with the bigger conservation outcomes, it's to do with local concerns about a particular thing that people don't like. And so, you know, you can understand that. And that's been a tool that's been used. And we have to find ways of ensuring that local people don't feel as though they're being ridden roughshod over in terms of their concerns being swept aside. Um, but at the same time, we do need to find more efficient ways, I would say, uh, of achieving the outcomes that we need. You know, we've known about nutrient pollution for a very long time and the solent turns green every summer and it's disgusting. And it's not only a problem for the birds, it's for the local people. Can we do better in finding ways of being able to deal with that pollution? The answer to that is yes, we probably can. Uh, but actually, I would say probably the, the, the principle that we need to bring to this is to be able to lift up the scale of analysis. And so to be, go to beyond that, those, those, those four houses um, or, or five or however many they were, eight houses in, yes. fair, in that Fairham case, that is not the right level to look at this. We need to be looking at the entire landscape and we need to be looking at all the sources of nutrient pollution that are going into the rivers and into the, into the groundwater. And we need to be dealing with it at the level of that catchment not four houses here, eight houses there, a hundred houses somewhere else, and hoping to find a resolution because we never will. Um, you know, it's a, as you say, it's, it's a growth uh, business for, for, for uh, the, the legal profession, but it's not necessarily a growth business for the birds that are on the receiving end of the pollution. And, and so if we are going to solve these problems, I think that is the, the, the key principle, lifting it up to a strategic scale, looking at the plan rather than the individual project, looking at the different policy levers we've got at that scale, and then to be deploying solutions at that far larger landscape dimension. And so, you know, this is something that increasingly is clear to us at Natural England. The Environment Bill hopefully will give us some, some more standing to do some of this work. And then we've got the local nature recovery strategies and the planning reforms. If all of this stuff can be harnessed to go in that direction, then maybe we can start to find some ways in which we can do this and get beyond those very technical and debilitating and paralyzing codes, which, um, you know, very few people understand them. And, you know, in terms of the outcomes that we see in the world, um, I don't think we're, we're getting what we need to see yet in terms of, you know, that shift uh, towards, you know, recovery of nature at scale, which, which, which is where we're going. I don't have a clapping hands emoji, but if I did, I'd be, I'd be pressing it now. Thanks, Tony. 
did say. Now, Mary, uh, you get to ask about um, uh, neutral neutrality. See, Paul, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> I've got. I was. I've got a number of things. I mean, I, can, can I just say, are, is Natural England working with the Environment Agency? Because that was one of my sort of. Yeah. That was one of my add-on questions be, to ensure this holistic yeah. approach, which is what you've just been talking yeah. about. Is, is that well, something that is going on? Yeah, it, it, it does do, Mary, but I think we could do more. Mm-hmm. And this is probably, um, it, 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 is, it is a kind of a horizontal thing for us in EA to be working together at regional level and joining up our capacities. Uh, but there's a higher level uh, dimension to this, which is about government directing all of its agencies to be joined up Indeed. and creating a policy framework that, that drives us all in the same direction. And, you know, that's quite complicated, but I think it is right uh, in terms of how, for instance, you know, Forestry Commission, Environment yes. Agency and Natural England work together in a particular landscape. So on neutri- neutrality and nature recovery, you know, the Forestry Commission does um, woodland establishment, Environment Agency does river water quality and pollution. We do nature recovery at Natural England. You would hope that all three of those agencies would be doing the same thing in the same landscape. And it doesn't necessarily go like that not because we we necessarily got conflicting approaches but we do have three separate founding sets of legislation three separate sets of regulatory tools three separate sets of budgets and so do they all point in the same direction in the same place sometimes i would say (laughs) indeed so here's a here's here's a, a, a um uh, another question I had for you, uh, which was really about the funding arrangements, actually, just just bringing it out a bit, just in terms of um, natural England, because when I first started um, in this business, A, there weren't too many ecologists, but B, when we went to Natural England, we usually got a particular letter from them. Now, nowadays, we rely on standing advice or we offer uh, uh, some clients um, pay for uh, advice. So can you just help explain the funding arrangements and um, is Natural England actually able to capture, as it were, through the fees they charge, you know, the costs of the service? Because uh, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of developers would be would be happy to pay, as it were, you know, for, uh, for a cost effective system. I'll be, I'll be my granddaughter just I'll be there in a That's second. That's all right. It's a family show. It's a family That's show. It. Don't you? And the fact that dog for dinner. Get, take the dog to have a dinner. That's it. Um, <laughs> um, funding. Uh, so, yeah, the funding arrangement. So, we are 90% funded um, from grant in aid by DEFRA. Um, with the remainder coming from some charging that we do, some some from other government departments and some from other uh, partners, including Heritage Lottery Fund on some projects, for instance. So um, it's mostly government. And, you know, during the period 2010 to when I arrived in 2018 as chair, uh, the organisation's budget shrank by more than 50%, uh, successive cuts to the budget, which meant that we were you know, drawing back our capability mm. on, on pretty much everything that we were doing. And, you know, I, I, it was cut beyond the bone is how I described it when I arrived in terms of our capability to cover all of these different statutory functions and duties, our advisory role, our ability to deliver government priority. Would you believe we operate in the order of 400 different duties and powers that have accumulated under successive acts of parliament going back to 1949 and so it's a vast range of of activity we cover and we were doing it on an increasingly uh ropey uh shoestring uh I'm not mixing up my strings and ropes but anyway it was um to the point where you know we we, we were we were unable to discharge the statutory functions at a level that we would like. So we did make the case for an expanded budget. And this year we've seen a very significant increase, um, which we are delighted about. There's complexity there because it's an increase linked to doing more work. Um, But we're hoping to work with the new budget and the existing old statutory functions to be able to create flexibility between the two, to be able to, to lift up, um, some of the old core work with the new work, but it but it has been um, an area that has required more investment over time and hasn't had it until now. Will require more investment into the future, and so this year we, we've had a big budget increase, but it's going to need to be more in the future if we're going to do all these things that are now government priorities. Thank you. It's, that's good news, and thank you. Thanks, Mary. Back to um, you, Charlie. Chris, um, have you finished your Big Mac yet? 
we got a yeah, question no, and all the school kids have gone they've had all their whoppers can i apologize for the free advertising <coughs> to greg's here um, <laughs> I might just, I'll move sideways and do yeah, what Ronaldo yeah, that's it. You've got it. I do what Nero, Ronaldo did at the Euros and just block out the advertising. <laughs> so I've got an audience question, if I may, uh, Tony. Uh, but just before I do, I'd just say, um, that's a cleaning trolley. Um, I'll just say that um, I think a lot of housing developments actually do deliver a huge amount of ecological and environmental improvement. They take agricultural fields. They often contain a third or a half of the site being given over to nature. Um, I think a lot of them are very positive in that way compared with chemically fueled, uh, intensively farmed agricultural fields. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you see the merits in that to an extent, so long as it is, is, it, is a good balance between the biodiversity yeah. planes. But the question that comes from Daisy Brassington is, she says, who's going to monitor all this biodiversity net gain? And I imagine some local authorities and local groups are quite worried that um, where, where are the resources to ensure that when a developer says there's going to be biodiversity net gain, that is actually going to happen. Do you, what, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. So j just on the housing versus open space. Yes, it, it is the case that housing, if it's done really well, it can be better than what was there before. And with the biodiversity net gain added in there, you know, this, this, this is potentially quite an opportunity. But as I said earlier, it's going to require the ecologists to be there with the developers at the beginning, thinking this through. I mean, there's other values, um, landscape and the view you had out of your window and now there's some houses in the way. You know, that, that's a different set of issues and, and it's legitimate and people do, do worry quite rightly about some of those things. But on the point as to whether you can finish up with more wildlife uh, than a wheat field, yes. And I mean, in my little garden here in Cambridge, there's all sorts of things that you would not find in, a, in an intensively farmed field. There's much more biodiversity here than would be there. And so, you know, this, this is something that needs to be blended into new housing development. It's also about that residents and how they'd like to have their garden. I mean, I could equally have that garden concreted over without two ponds and without two oak trees and without, you know, a miniature orchard. Um, I choose to have it like that. So there's a cultural dimension. But yes, you're right. Chris, you know, the, the, it's not necessarily the case that always putting a housing estate in a green field is going to be bad for wildlife. It can be the opposite. Uh, so on the biodiversity net gain and how actually we do ensure that in the future that tool um, is actually leading to some good outcomes. As I said earlier, you know, this is going to require an investment of scrutiny over time. You know, expecting the developers to do this and then, you know, they've gone and then who's accountable? There is going to have to be some level of, of monitoring and to make sure that the deal actually is fulfilled. And, you know, I've, I come across anecdotal cases where, you know, I'm told when I go on field visits, you know, the housing developer said they would do this and they didn't do it. And who's going to do anything about that? And they said it would be, um, you know, an improvement by planting these trees. The trees are all dead. Nobody's doing anything about it. And so this is really a, a big concern. And I think if this policy is going to have support and credibility going forward, the local authorities who are going to be responsible for administering this, they are going to have to invest in the capability to make sure that the, you know, the, the deal is fulfilled. Because, you know, once the houses are up and everyone's moved in and the, the developers have gone, um, you know, it's easy to, to see that the developer, you know, in some cases at least, may not be too bothered um, about what happens to their biodiversity net gain. Uh, you know, we will have a role um, in some respects in, in the oversight of the quality of all of this, but local authorities are going to be very much in the driving seat and they're going to need to have the capability to make sure this stuff works. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Chris. Tony, thank you so much. What an amazing hour of insight and inspiration that's been. Uh, so many questions. We could go on for another two hours, I think. But, we uh, could. We have, to, we have to draw to a close, not least so you can uh, entertain your lovely grandchildren. Go and thank see you. Well. that dog, see if, they, see if they've fed her. They might just be uh, uh, taunting her. I've but, had a but, <laughs> Tony, just to let you know what we, what we do after the end of the show is we'll make yeah. sure all the audience questions are always sent to the guests. So um, okay. you, you will have all the questions, those which haven't been oh. asked. You'll, you'll right. have to off. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, thanks ever so much. Very nice to be with you all. Lovely. And, and I say, please, um, please keep up the great work. It's really fascinating to hear all that's going on, a lot, a lot of which we weren't aware of. So thank you for that. Next week, we have Paul Brocklehurst, the chair of the uh, LPDF, the Land Promoters and Developers Federation. We're looking forward to welcoming him at the same time, the same place. I'll be in quarantine then. So uh, that'll be great fun. <laughs> um, till then, have a nice weekend to come and we'll see you next week. Thanks again, Tony. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tony.